Hi guys, it's Jim Black with another edition of No Before You Owe. I'm here today with a good friend of mine, Victor Lund, who owns and operates the Wave Group. And Victor and I became good friends a few years ago at some of these industry events in real estate. And I'm honored to have you on my show, Victor. I know you uh, have a lot going on, so thank you for spending time with us today on No Before You Owe. It's great to be here, Jim. I flattered that you'd have me on. Uh, I've always been such a fan of yours and all the work that you do. It's just, it's great to be here and to meet some of your folks. Thank you so much. So you are a man, you are a modern day real estate renaissance man. <laughs> you have about 76 things going on simultaneously and it's seamless. You can walk into any room, you know everybody, and you know them in like six different degrees of separation. So it's not just about business at hand. It's about some other relationship you have or something else going on or some other industry event you're going to be at with. Can you explain the background around Wave Group and how it all got started? Sure. It'd be my pleasure. It's a, it's a proud story. I, you know, I was raised in an entrepreneurial family. My father started a boat company um, after he got out of the military. Uh, he, had, he was a riveter in the Navy and uh, he made the first aluminum fishing boat. So Lund Boat Company is our family's business. I was raised in that business. And uh, as my father exited in 1979, when I was in college or high school rather, you know, he started doing different entrepreneurial things and investing in companies and things like that. And uh, soon after I graduated from college, I started doing the same thing. I, I really felt like venture capital and finance, that part of the industry and, and building companies and turning them around and influencing how they grow and mature. That really is what excited me. And it's been my passion ever since like, I don't know, the early mid nineties, I guess. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. And now if I'm to look at Wave Group right now, literally you guys are anything from consultants to helping turn around companies to helping create strategic plans and then from compensation models for key executives to oh, industry yeah. events and mergers and acquisitions like how did you get, um, how did you decide on that specific niche? What was it about real estate or FinTech or technology? Um, obviously being in the, the, um, entertainment industry or the, I should call it recreation industry. It's a little different than the high stress, you know, multi-million dollar transactional side of things. Sure. So during the late nineties, when venture capital was a really exciting space to be in pretty much every deal that you did had money come, you know, tripping over itself, trying to get in on it. IPOs, mergers, acquisition, just deal making was really exciting at that time. And then suddenly it got turned off. <laughs> so we very quickly pivoted to supporting the companies that we had invested in. Um, a lot of times those companies were, you know, cash strapped. They needed business development. Like how can we sell this company? How can we merge this company with something else? hard time retaining people. So we would step in as a virtual CFO, a virtual chief marketing officer, technology support, whatever it took to get that company to some kind of goal line in terms of uh, converting it into some positive equity for investors. And i really fell into a uh, line with a number of companies that we had invested in that were in the real estate space. I started working with those companies and really beginning to understand that ecosystem. And most of the work that we do isn't like the consumer facing stuff that you might imagine. It's more the systems that power the real estate industry. So we started uh, the, the largest body of work that we did at the time in real estate was in helping MLSs select their vendors. Um, there's, you know, a handful, five or six MLS systems that all the realtors use. These are enterprise systems. They can have, you know, a hundred thousand users on them or more. Um, and it was beyond the technical expertise of most real estate uh, associations who, who they kind of own most of the MLSs. It was beyond their expertise to really uh, understand how to select and operate some of these software systems and how to build support teams around it to really fulfill uh, their mission to support the realtor and the broker. We started doing the, uh, the vendor selection process that quickly led into a strategic planning business. Uh, my business partner, Marilyn Wilson, ran strategic planning for Mattel Corporation globally. 
Um, strategic planning is a process. Uh, it takes um, skill to engineer successful um, events, and we started doing those for MLSs and associations. And um, two things that Maryland really innovated on was strategic planning. One was research. So uh, surveying the satisfaction of users at the MLS to determine whether or not the solutions being offered, the support being offered was really helping them sell more real estate. And similarly with brokerages, like how is the MLS supporting your business? And with brokerages that kind of leaned into a lot of the technical engineering behind data movement, like taking data from the MLS and powering systems in the brokerage community. So. We went from working with associations and MLSs to working with large enterprise scale brokerages, um, helping them to, to really take action off the data that they had access to and turning that into a better business for themselves. Um, so we, we started a research company. We really started to look at satisfaction, um, user usage, helping brokers select their business partners. Cause same again, you know, you can sell a lot of real estate and not necessarily know how to handle the technical the technical back end of things for that. So uh, from there, Wave Group um, began to explore other ways that we could help our, our companies really execute their strategic plans more effectively. So in addition to research and strategic planning and vendor selection for brokers and agents, we started working in areas of communication. So communications is probably the biggest, most difficult thing, not only telling your you know, if you're a broker telling real estate agents and teams what it is, you know, like that communicating to your own people, if you have 10,000 people that are working for your brokerage, that's a heavy communications lift. So we started doing that, doing the same thing for MLSs and associations. And that kind of gave birth to Wave Group Communications, which is one of our centers of excellence. And we expanded beyond that into technology. So not only selecting vendors, for real estate brokers and MLSs, but actually implementing. That opened up, you know, a can of worms and a lot of different external services that we provide, things like helping companies negotiate good SaaS agreements with their vendors and getting into technical things like data licensing, strategy work, like, you know, how to syndicate effectively to publishers like Zillow and Realtor.com and the, the many others. So we, we kind of developed a, a lot of experience, not only on the strategy side, but actually implementing it, communicating it, making sure that the, the data is flowing right, that the systems are integrated, all of those things. And then uh, four years ago, we expanded into another new area uh, for Wave Group, which is in mergers and acquisitions. All alongside doing all of this, we have a completely other company called RE Technology. We're the largest publisher of technology information to the real estate industry um, through that site. So we're over here consulting with firms, trying to help them out, trying to get them where they need to go. And then on the other side of things, we're, we're helping educate them on how to use technology in their, in their business. That's awesome. So it sounds like you're taking the higher level things that Maryland's learned in larger organizations, nationally or internationally, driving them down to the local level of either the individual like myself or a mid-sized team, thousands, two thousands of people to basically replicate ideas or thoughts or strategies. And everything you're doing seems to be complementing each other, right? You're, it seems like yeah. they can get one sliver of your business, of your, of your platform or, or a lot of different um, elements that can enhance their ability to get, to be better and be stronger and run a better business. Yeah. I, you know, my background uh, from the venture capital community kind of helped me or it, it positioned me to really operate at the board level. So I have a lot of experience helping boards get the most out of their leadership teams and things like that. And, uh, and then all of our resources that we have under wave group, all of our 12 consultants, each have a center of you know excellence and things that they do if it's a communications problem we got a guy for that technology problem we got a guy for that and more recently we brought on george slusser to wave group and he runs our m a division so we're probably the largest brokerage mergers and acquisitions group um, in the country right now and it's not a dull moment for that obviously it's a very exciting and stressful time for a lot of brokers brokerages what are you know they're trying to figure out all the new lawsuits, all the changes in the environment, the competitive nature of offering compensation, all those things are so important now and, and consumers are becoming more um, educated and understand more about the process and all the moving parts of it all. Um, that's exciting. I, uh, I share a similar thing with you. I used to be 
in venture capital for Hamburg and Quist, H and Q back in the day. I don't even know Hamburg and Quist, but they were a boutique investment bank in San Francisco. Got bought by Chase, and then J.P. Morgan Chase merged. And it was kind of those relationship things that you guys are still doing today. You know, having the expertise in different categories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's very exciting. So we met. We got to we got to last kind of spend time together at、um, an event. Last summertime in Las Vegas, but what I was most impressed about you was how you orchestrated a two-day industry leadership video marketing series for one of the companies that we're both part of, and、yeah. it was impressive to see how spot on you were. With I think there was what 15 different categories of industry、yeah. expertise, and、yeah. you had a very well-known production company filming, and you had. Completely dialed in every single element to a two-day video shoot. I think you could probably earn an Emmy or Grammy or whatever it's called、uh, <laughs> for your efforts because to get first A type personality people that are on some serious ADHD levels to be able to focus and listen and take your guidance in front of cameras and in a、uh, 25 million dollar home that was beautiful. It was impressive. Can you share? About how you pulled that off, what went into that? That was sure. I'm going.、Uh, so the the business challenge there that you know is probably worthy of a of an academic paper was get real estate experts in mortgage and real estate and title and every component of the real estate transaction to talk about the need or demand for a product they've never heard of, seen, and don't even know exists. So that was the real skill behind that is that <laughs> we were. I interviewed、uh, through the series of a couple of days real estate coaches and experts and practitioners about what's really missing in the real estate industry, and I, I think you've done a podcast of,、um, for this company. It's a well-known company now. It's called Milestones, and、uh, you and I are both investors. But the、uh, the the trick to that was just engaging people at their level and just asking them like, what is it about your business which is The most painful, and I think for all real estate practitioners in mortgage and in title, they have seen their relationship with the consumer get intercepted by a third party. And so, for people selling homes, that those are companies like Zillow and Trulia and Realtor.com and so many others. And you know what? Most what most consumers don't know is that when you go to one of those websites and you connect with a professional, they're going to take roughly forty percent of that agent's commission. So. Wow, that's a big number for all those people on this call or this video. Forty percent of anything is gone poof to technology, out the door does not get reinvested in the local community through maybe donation, charity, sponsorships of things. It is gone to some other, sometimes other countries for that matter, that and it's gone. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know what Milestones does is they have a solution that that I mean it helps during the buy and close process. Those are. The buy and close process is a pretty well knit environment in terms of the volume of applications that support the industry, and you know I I don't think that you'll run across many practitioners today unless they're like a brand new company that doesn't say you know yeah I've got something for that. Where the industry was really lacking is in relationship management that meant something. So whether you're in mortgage or real estate. You know, you you have some stupid drip marketing system that tells you when to rewind your clock when you you know, or move it forward when you spring ahead. Or here's my favorite recipe. Like, just really, it's great content, but the content isn't really specialized to you. What Milestones does is they allow you to like build a home ownership hub. And if you have, you know, your healthcare network probably has a place where you can log in and see all your healthcare transactions. You can log in if you know to your child's school. Or university, this is my case, and see how they're doing academically, and find out what events. Ooh, wow! The, adult, the parents looking at my grades would not be good.、Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that, that I'm glad that didn't exist when I went to.、Canada. I had that wired, <laughs> so I was good on that. But the but you know what Milestones does is they're bringing、uh, assembling together like some functionality that brings the the lender, the real estate agent, the insurance agent, the title.、Um, Company all into an environment where you can learn how to maintain and track the maintenance on your home. So、uh, I'm down here in Florida. I just took over a home.、Uh, my parents passed away, so we took over that house. 
And, you know, we're doing all kinds of things. We painted everything. So like rather than those paint cans going in the garage, they go right into milestones. I know the code five years from now, I can look it up and say, I need that color or, you know, the, all of the, there's like 150 systems in most houses, water heaters, HVAC system, right. gutters, you know, just whatever. Um, the filter that goes into your refrigerator, you know, for most people, every time you do a project to maintain one of those things, you're starting at the beginning again. You know, you go take the filter out and say, what filter is? I got to go look it up. You know, when did I change it last? Geez, I don't remember. You know, people just aren't organized around home delivers that. It delivers it really well. I, I really like the functionality of teaching the homeowner how to do it themselves. Um, as well as the ability to just hit a button and get a pro and the magic of what we were talking about in that uh, that video series is how real estate professionals were sharing their stories of the great professionals that they work with and one of the classics that came out of that session was a real estate agent from the seattle area very very successful agent runs a team she said yeah like my customers don't want angie's list they want my list if they need a landscape or a plumber, electrician, somebody to do a quick remodel, somebody to paint the house, come whatever, you name it. I got a person, you know, and uh, I just thought that was really powerful. You know, video has become, uh, you know, over the last decade, really since the launch of YouTube and the popularization of YouTube has really become an excellent way of communicating. You know, uh, it's from somebody who works in communications. We always talk about surround sound, you know, you need communications to be everywhere on all platforms so you know your your email campaigns you're you know calling people up and physically having events and touching base with them personally doing videos writing articles images like every way every possible method of communication lends to the overall effectiveness of it and you know just trying to get people in a lot of different places all at the same time so we really had to switch uh the industry narrative for that particular video project we had to get people to start thinking about maintaining relationships with their past clients as being more important than finding new customers and going through that lead to lead to close process your existing customers are your foundation those are the people that give you all the referrals and those are the people that give you all of the repurch, you know, when they buy additional homes or whatever. And, and if you, the, the, the weird numbers, and this is strange for me, the number is exactly the same for mortgage and real estate. One out of five of your clients that you did business with in the past will do another transaction and not use, or four out of five will do another transaction and not use you. Only one out of five does. And yeah, it's hard to hear that. It's hard to hear that after helping a lot of people, but I understand you got to be top of mind. You got to add value. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's amazing how real estate mortgage professionals are constantly, you know, contributing more and more and more money into advertisers or trying to buy leads from these people that have already intercepted your customer at great expense while ignoring all of the people who are most likely to do business with you again because you treated them well and you did a good job the first time absolutely i love the insight there that you provided and you talked about relationships and and also this industry while it's changing and evolving it is about stuff like we're doing now right staying mm -hmm. connected staying relevant having common interests or values that you share and then giving guidance and advice to let people make a good decision so that they have the information, they're making the decision. I think my job is to empower them with the tools and let them choose. Because if they're part of that process, they will, I think, have more appreciation for it, more gratitude for it, and know that they they were empowered to do that. So that's big for, for me in my career. So let's talk about careers. Let's say if you were to look back in time, because part of this part of this podcast really is to be able to go back in time and ask and give yourself insights or knowledge or perspective at a younger version of Victor, having fun in college, living life, uh, and, and enjoying it. I'm sure you had a blast wherever you were. Um, but I would like you to share some insights that you would have given yourself advice on, you know, 20, 30 years ago before the crazy meltdown of the, you know, high tech. Uh, firm, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would say I was taught by a lot of mentors, uh, to always pay yourself first. And I don't think that was sound advice. Um, had I paid myself less, but pulled on additional consultants and hired more people sooner, I, my business would be far more successful than it is today. And I've repeatedly made that mistake. I don't make it anymore, but I repeatedly <laughs> made 
that made that mistake. Um, building successful companies takes people. I strongly believe in hire slow, fire fast, but we would not be anywhere close to where we are today as a company if it weren't for all of the contributions made by all the people that work at Wave Group. And it's really allowed, you know, it, it, Wave Group is now, you know, it's no longer a company that's driven by Victor and Marilyn's relationships. There's 12 of us out there that all have relationships and they cross each other. And so that, that really was something I wish I had done quite a bit sooner. It's very powerful. So surrounding yourselves around people that can bring value to you, perspective, mm -hmm. and help you grow and learn and, and thrive basically is what I'm hearing. Yeah. And I think that applies not only to, you know, if you, if you own a business, like bringing people into your company, but also building additional companies. So we started doing a couple of things, you know, more than a decade ago, which have really been, you know, creating some long-term success when, well, when wave group was, you know, profitable and, you know, we had extra financial support there. We, we went and started this other company, RE Technology. There was, we had, a, we, our customers identified the need. So MLS has said to us, we want like the, back in, I don't know, it was 2006 blogging kind of got started. People really started doing it like in, in the later nineties or I'm sorry, in the later like 2000s. Yeah. And, you know, pretty much everybody had a blog. If you went to any conference, like the way we talk about AI today, we talked about blogging then, you know? Um, so our MLS clients um, went, you know, they hired us to go in and survey their agents and said, hey, if we were to have a blog, what kind of content we'd want on it? And they said, the number one thing we need is how to use technology in our business. And MLS has looked at that and they said, well, I can't be an expert on all this technology. There's hundreds of companies. How am mm -hmm. I going to do it? And not, but it was the same answer for the MLS in Chicago, the MLS in Southern California, the MLS in, in the San Jose Silicon Valley area, the, the, the larger MLSs on the East Coast, down in Florida, they all have the same problem. They're like, we would need a staff, all these people, and they would have to know what they're writing about, but they would also have to be able to write it in realtor speak. Like you're talking to a, a second, you know, a seasoned person, like in their fifties, it's not a digital native more often than not. They want to use these tools, but like, they don't want to, they don't want to live in them. Like they sell real estate or they sell loans. They don't live in software. So we kind of understood that voice and were able to articulate to their, to that, to our MLS clients. And they all just kind of pushed the chips over and said, Victor, Marilyn, why, why don't you guys build a blog for all the technology and real estate? And we'll all offer it as a member benefit to our, to our MLS subscribers. So we launched that in 2010 with a hundred thousand subscribers today. It has 700,000, 800,000, you know, so it, it really took off, but the, the whole idea is taking extra capital in one business and then you roll it into the second one. And by vert, now you have losses as you grow business number two that offset capital gains and business gains in the primary company. So you're kind of using or borrowing tax money to set up your next company and your next company and your next so like one foot back, one foot backwards to take two steps forward. Yeah. Right. And, and again, you know, not paying yourself. Like I, I could have taken that money out of the business and put it into the stock market or other investments and things like that. But I said, no, the best way for me to, to capitalize on this extra money is to go build company number two and company number three and company number four. And we have built those companies. We, a lot of times we build them with partners because, you know, startups are hard and they take leaders. So a lot of times we'll invest in, you know, another company's idea or our idea that's being driven by another company and then roll out of it and invest in the next thing. So, so really this is a weird thing, but the best way to grow your business is by not paying yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. All right. Speaking of pay, speaking about making money, um, you have a book that I, I yes. been looking at a little bit. I would love for you to share it with our audience. Cause I'll make sure I blast it out on our podcasts and YouTube channels, but tell us yeah. about the book that you co authored and, and kind of the thesis behind it. Sure. So the book's called acquiring more profit. It's the, it's sort of a second edition book. My, my partner 15 years ago wrote a book called acquiring profit and my partner, George, he was instrumental at all of the Merrill purchases in real estate and then graduated, did work for Prudential and, you know, spent a couple of decades at what is now called anywhere, formerly Realogy. 
And so all of the, you know, he's done like six to 10,000 transactions acquiring real estate companies. So when he and I got together and he came onto Wave Group to run our M&A division, he told me about this book. I'm like, send me a copy. And I read it and I kid you not, Jim, what he wrote in that <laughs> book 20 years ago is as relevant today as it was then. So in our rewrite, you know, if, if you ever talk to any author, they'll tell you, well, if I had it to do all over again, I would add this change this. So uh, George did some of his ad changes. What we really contributed, I really contributed to the book was more fundamental action based types of items. So this really is a script. This was like nine chapters. We're doing a webinar series by the, by the way, right now. Oh, cool. I'm going to watch that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's nine done. chapters. It walks you through step-by-step step, every component of a successful, uh, a successful merger and acquisition, you know, from scouting potential customer or potential merger uh, people to how to develop that relationship. When you get to NDA, when, you know, how to keep it quiet. Um, how to like, we have spreadsheets on, you know, how to compare and contrast the companies, how to do the valuation, how to get to the contract. And then, you know, the real fun starts on day one. When you let the agents know you may have been working this <laughs> yeah. seven or eight years <laughs> or seven, eight months, but then, you know, you announce it to the agents and oh my word, what, are, how are they going to react? Of course, there's issues with agents, you know, maybe not be happy. They may want to leave or stuff like that. And you want to retain them. So you, you know, you really got to have it right, but it's a rinse and repeat activity. Um, we work with many of the largest brokerage purchasers in the country today, companies that are definitely in acquisition mode. But a lot of times we, we work like either the buy side or the sell side. It's just like real estate. Like we can only represent one person and more often than not, we're representing the seller. So you have a fiduciary responsibility to your, to your client, to make sure that everything you're doing is in the best interest of them. And there's no, uh, no confusion or any type of cost yeah. we, collaboration. We do evaluation on the company, it's something that accounting people will call adjusted EBITDA. So all of you business owners know that there's certain things you run through your company because it advantages you in the tax system. And, but if somebody else owned that company, they probably wouldn't pay for your car or your boat's probably not an entertainment expense. You know? <laughs> yeah. True. So whatever it is, yeah. you know, so we do adjusted even, you know, a lot of, a lot of the adjustments we make have to do with the income that is delivered to the owners. So, you know, getting back to what I said about paying yourself, you know, there, there were years when I would not pay myself hardly anything like 30 grand a year, you know, because wow. I didn't need the income and I wanted the company, the, the income to go into buying something else. Well. If somebody came and bought Wave Group and they saw that the founder was making thirty thousand dollars, they would have to adjust that up to you know what a founder would go or an executive at a consulting firm would be paid, you know, which would be into the hundreds. So almost so, like a growth versus value play, right? Growth means you're yeah. reinvesting all your earnings to get the highest multiple or earnings or value perspective you can, and value means you're driving income or something more consistent, almost more like a bond or a dividend right. type of thing. So, well, if you pay yourself out of your company, you know, that money's gone. You pay your tax, you get diluted 30 or whatever percent or whatever your tax rate is. And that money is out of your business. It's, you got to put it in somewhere else. Um, whereas any money that you have in retained earnings can be reinvested and structured. So again, you take that third or more that the government takes and you reinvest it in uh, growing your business or growing a new business or something like that. So we come up with adjusted EBITDA. We put a price on a company. We talk to the founders about who in their market they might be interested in merging with because culture matters. We talk a lot in the book about culture because when you merge businesses, if there's conflict, then both businesses fail. And we're kind of in this weird area right now. 2023 was a pretty horrible year for most real estate companies and mortgage originators or mortgage people. You know, transaction volume way, 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 way down 35%. Well, you know, if you, Every business has sort of a a, a a a certain amount of revenue that they have to bring in every month in order to stay solvent. And in real estate, for like a small office, that that that's some number depending on where you are in America and the price of homes. But let's just use a fictitious number of ten units a month to keep an office open. So if the market's down by thirty five percent, you're doing seven, six. So you're underwater every month and you look right across the street at the office uh, of your competitor and you can go in the MLS and see how many units they're doing. And if they're in the same place, they're, they're also losing money. 
you take those two seven or eight unit companies or six or seven unit companies and put them together now you have a profitable 14 unit business or 12 unit business. so we're doing a ton of mergers right now um for independent companies you know it's it's usually easier to go indie to indie for franchise groups it's a lot easier to partner up with another franchisee that might be in an adjacent area, or at least they don't need to be at least somebody who has the common mindset of how you operate a business under that franchise. So when you can find those kinds of synergies and put those companies together, now you take two losing businesses and you make a winning business. And, uh, and, and that's really where we're focused right now. So I like those perspectives. Again, the first one is, taking two companies, combining together for shared resources in that area to make them more efficient and more profitable. And the other one's almost like JP Morgan and Chase merging, where you have two different platforms, two different areas, locations that are spread out that can mutually benefit from being in the same marketplace that they aren't in already. So that, that makes sense. Yeah, I think I, not to argue with my host here, but I think, <laughs> you know, Chase was a really good commercial banker and JP Morgan was a really good investment company. And, you know, that those types of mergers were paralleled. You know, you had Merrill merging with Bank of America. You know, there were a bunch of those. Um, I think Citibank kind of led the charge on that, if I'm not I mistaken. I guess it's more of a Chase Wamu um, purchase. That would be more. Yeah, but I mean, Wamu, the, the point Washington is, is like. Mutual had the platform that was a West yeah. Coast oh, and Chase East okay. Coast. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, what I was thinking <laughs> is, you know, Consumers definitely need banking services. They also need investment banking services. So while they're in the branch with their pile of cash, you know, if you have a high account balance in your checking account, you should probably go talk to the the investment people uh, about putting that money to use, um, you know, those types of things. So there were synergies around serving a broader array of the consumer's need um, at that branch level. And it drove down costs, you know, no more two buildings, one building. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So and, and with consumer banking too, like, you know, people don't go in, you know, with the electronic checks and the Zelle payments and all these other things. I mean, then you can deposit a, a check using your phone with, with all this technology automation that's happened in banking. Like, what are you going to do with this huge bank office with nobody going there? You know, they, they are a lot like nursing homes today. When you go into a bank, it's pretty quiet. <laughs> There's not it much is, happening. It is so quiet, yeah. The, a lot the of space. Check cashing is done. It's all direct deposit. <laughs> you don't have to go there anymore, you know? That's good. So so let's uh, let's look forward to things you're excited about as all these different things you're involved with keep evolving and keep the synergy keeps growing and growing and momentum keeps growing. What, looking forward, what are some of the things you're excited about in 2024 and beyond? Do you have anything that stands out to you? Is it spending more time doing family stuff? Is it work related stuff? Is it exciting mergers? What's what's going on? Yeah, well, on the personal front, my daughter graduates from college from Syracuse University at the end of the year or in the springtime. So we're certainly preparing to celebrate that episode in her life. And I'm highly focused on like the what's next thing for her. Um, obviously every business owner would love to see their child come to work for them, but I, I don't know that that's in the cards. She, she went to uh, Syracuse. She's at the Newhouse School of Communications. So part of the reason why we started a PR firm is, hey, if you want to do PR, let's do that. But she really kind of fell into the advertising st side of things. And um, she's an incredible copywriter and ad writer. And that's really what she likes uh, more than anything. She also got a business degree. So she will understand p and and balance sheets and things like that, which I'm proud of. Um, but yeah, I mean, I want to get her settled. I want to help her, you know, find her next thing. As for us at Wave Group, we are incredibly busy with strategic planning right now as MLSs, brokerages, and associations of realtors really try to understand how they're going to operate uh, as this lawsuit works its way out. I've written a bunch of articles of, you know, advising clients to uh, plan plan for the worst, but hope for the best. Um, I think that the industry has a case and I'm not going to go into the case. We've heard about it ad nauseum, but I, I think that the uh, the judge got it wrong. I think he he talked about it. You know, his decision to make it a per se antitrust case instead of a rule of reason case was a mistake. So I, I think that we're going to be OK, but plan for the worst, you know 
you need to talk That's to the, the attorney because if you get named in this lawsuit, if you if the industry doesn't win these appeals, like you're not there's there's no way that the industry can pay back can pay this stuff back. So we're you know we're at an existential crisis moment with associations, brokerages, and MLSs as they deal with that. If you put that stuff aside and say, well, what should businesses be focused on in 2024? Um, it it kind of draws me back to um, a few things which I believe go together. Um, I one of the things that happened during COVID, and this this actually dates back uh, to a client we worked with for many years, Pacific Union um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, San Francisco is a, a strange place. You actually have your home inspected before you list it for sale. Usually, um, the real estate agent wants to know what's wrong with the house what they have to disclose to the buyer early on in the process. And they want to be able to mitigate those issues if they're going to deflect the value of the home. So uh, Pacific Union had a program for their real estate agents where if an agent had a property that needed some work and the customer couldn't afford to, to do the sell side repairs before they listed it, he would, you know, Mark McLaughlin uh, would just give them the money and for paper that would be settled at close. Like you need 50 grand, here's 50 grand, get your house fixed. I'll take the 50 out of the closings in 30, 60, 90 days. Um, so that became Compass Concierge and uh, Compass has been sort of running that program very successfully. Uh, other companies have had to kind of emulate that program in order to compete at the listing table. Like my compass agent said, they'll fix my roof. <laughs> what will you do for me? <laughs> uh, so, you know, large firms have been able to come up with programs. Berkshire Hathaway has good programs. A lot of independent firms, you know, like John L. Scott, when, you know, all of the, the sophisticated companies have come up with programs. Uh, we found a company that came out of the Seattle marketplace called House Amp, and they're going to make that service available to any broker in America. So. Any broker who wants to set up some kind of a white label concierge process to advance um, money to the seller for home repairs uh, can do so under the house amp program. And uh, so they, they charge like a closing fee, which you're very familiar with, um, but it's 90 days interest free on the money. So the house usually sells before that happens. Cool. Um, so based, so what I'm hearing is stay ahead of uh, getting your top dollar for your property by being efficient. Yeah having everything disclosed and then give people options as if they want to sell it in their current state or if they want to do the improvements, but give them the choices to allow them to be the expert or have the experts uh, provide the services for them. Yeah. If you're a broker and you don't have that solution, you're competing against companies that do, you're going to lose the deal. Yeah. So we're excited about House, House Amp. Um, they're in the process of uh, doing some announcements of some partnerships. It's going to take them from six states to all of them. So I think that's going to be very liberating for brokers who are losing deals because they can't compete. Now they'll be able to compete. Um, the milestones rollout is going to be very front and center um, this year. I think there's going to be a race for home ownership portals. People aren't going to have two. So if I put all of my information into one portal, that's, that's where it's it. Yeah. yeah, just like a bank, just like a right. bank. Once no, I, to get my I, bill pay or ACH, yeah, I'm you're stuck not, there, right? Yeah, you're not going to switch off. Yeah, so, same way. Uh, we're excited for that. Um, we really think that um, as that works its way into the industry at all of its various levels, it's really going to provide a lot of important solutions to enrich that relationship between the home buyer, seller, the real estate agent, the mortgage provider, their lender, their their everybody you know because you can invite anybody you want in like i of course we have three properties my wife and my child they're in they're in our portal and we know like what we have to do next month on our house on each house <laughs> and cool. if i'm gone which like i'm in florida right now my wife's in california if she needs something done she doesn't have to call me and say who do we use for that she just goes right into the oh and you just click the button and it just sends the information about what we need done directly to the person that that we work with. And if it's some, if we don't know who to work with, I can just hit another button and my ask my agent like, "Hey, I need somebody to do this. Who do you got?" I'm. I we we've, we've had two buildings on our home in California since we bought it. Like one two bedroom house, one three bedroom house. It's a little different way of you know having bigger spaces to have two spaces, which we love because my my in laws lived with us through their end of life care. But now with this whole ADU movement in California and elsewhere, I called the county. I got a new address for my property. So for the second house. So now I can get separate utilities hooked up and all that stuff. And I would never have been able to do that without the advice of my realtor and my law officer. So really cool, cool stuff. Yeah. So I'm really excited about those two things. There's a whole bunch of other stuff we have, but 
you know, we are, we're really quite a bit focused on driving solutions that are going to replace how we do business in real estate. If the offer of compensation isn't part of the MLS anymore, you know, I heard uh, uh, of a really good idea the other day, just make it a seller concession. So we're already formatting around, you know, when you submit an offer for a property, you're submitting a request for commission as well. It's a component, just like I request a roof replaced or something else. So um, I'm getting the yeah, getting, you know, first you have to get the idea right. And we're collaborating with everybody around the industry to get that done. And once we have the idea right, then it'll be the implementation and the software systems that allows it to happen and the documents that are required that are required that, you know, that you need to, to have a contract and things like that. So yeah, 2024 is going to be good by all accounts. We're going to see some interest rate reductions. You know, I think uh, you would know better than me, but you know, for most for most homeowners, you know, a significant drop in interest rate puts, you know, 400 to 700 or more dollars in their pocket each month. And that's, uh, that'll be welcome, you know, for Yeah, I think it's going to free up, I think it's going to free up inventory also. People are stuck because sure. they know that there's such a differential right now in yeah. payments and cost of, cost of borrowing living. So, awesome. for sure. Well, well I'm, I'm appreciative of you, Victor, yeah. always being on our show. I love seeing you in person and I can't wait to see you at the next event. And yeah, um, I'll put all your information on our podcast for all the details. Can you let everyone know where to, where to find more about you guys? Yeah. W a V group.com. So it's, uh, so there's, you know, there's a wave like we have in California that you surf on and then there's a digital wave, which is audio or video. So anyway, it's, it's the digital forum. So wave group, W a V group.com. And I'm also Victor Lund on every social media platform. You can DM me. I'll hit you right back. <laughs> Awesome, Victor. Thanks again for your We're time. On the phone and away we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's another edition of No Before You. Thanks again. Like and subscribe to us. And we'll see you soon, Victor. Thanks for your time. Right. Thanks, brother. Take, Take care. care.